The carefree days of summer are long gone. And as conscientious growers, our thoughts turn to the cleanup and care of our gardens after another successful season. I actually like this time of year because we can work at our own pace. It gives me time to pause, catch my breath, and reflect on what did and didn't work in this year's garden. While there are a few plantings to take care of, such as our garlic and our spring flower bulbs, right now is the calm before the storm of next year's crops. But just because the pace slows down doesn't mean that there's nothing to do. So for those that missed it, here's episodes 101 to 111. Enjoy. Mulch. Not too thick, but not too thin. Without an actual concrete number, that's not very helpful, is it? Like we've always said, bare soil is a no-no. And as conscientious growers, we take the opportunity to mulch whenever possible. The question is, what's the right amount? Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie. The show where in two minutes or less, we mention mulch at least once. And today, it's going to be a lot more times than once because the whole episode is about mulching. Mulching thickness to be exact. Time short as it always is, so let's get into it. As we well know, mulch is the single most important protective barrier for your precious topsoil. Eliminating erosion, drought, weed colonization, and extreme temperatures. The question is never should we mulch, but rather how much we should mulch with. And the answer to that is, well, it depends. You see, mulch thickness is a factor of the time of year, the climate you're growing in, the crop you're mulching, and the material of the mulch itself. Too thin and you'll get no weed suppression. They'll just poke through no problem. But too thick and you run the risk of choking out the main crop, which of course we don't want. With all those factors combined and interacting with each other, it can get kind of confusing sometimes. So let's look at a couple specific crop examples to show you how I tackle mulch thickness. First, at the one end of the scale, we have your direct seeded crops, things like beets and carrots. While these guys definitely benefit from a mulch, it has to be light and it has to be thin. Otherwise, those young seedlings are not going to be able to punch through once they germinate. So, max a half inch thick, sometimes even less. Moving up, but staying with our direct seeded crops, we have things like radishes and peas. Now, these guys can punch through much thicker mulches, upwards of an inch or so. Right away, even though we're staying in the same category of crops, we can already start to see a variability in mulch thickness. Okay, moving on, we got our transplants. Crops like peppers, tomatoes, zucchinis, and even strawberries. Go around two inches thick to really cover that soil. The plants are well started and already growing above the mulch, so there's no risk in burying them. Having said that though, the material can also affect the thickness. On the one hand, you have straw, and it's great because it's light, airy, and fully structured. But when you use something like wet grass clippings, even though it's a great mulch, it can clump when you get into higher quantities. So much so that you may have to dial back the thickness, or at least stagger the applications. Know what you'll never have to dial back though? Watching more episodes of The Garden Quickie. What a year. Crops were grown, bounty was harvested, and hopefully your gardening season was another success. But shorter day length, decreased temperatures, and the coming winter means our gardens are about to shut it down for the year. But it's not all bad. This annual dormancy can be a welcome rest period for both our gardens and for us growers. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome back to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we're anything but dormant. And today's episode 
is all about that winter dormancy. Or, more accurately, how to protect our gardens and our garden beds from the harshness of winter. I got three ways to do it, time short as always, so let's dive in. Whenever we talk about winter protection for our gardens, what we really mean is soil protection. Bare soil left exposed to the elements will cease to be a viable garden soil, even in the most benign winters. So the first way to protect our dormant gardens is to simply cover them up. This can be as rudimentary as simply placing cardboard, wood, or even yard waste over your garden beds, all the way up to more elaborate methods such as plan and strategic chop and drops. Whichever method you pick, covered soil will be infinitely more usable to grow next year's crops than soil left exposed. And the second method for your winter soil protection are cover crops. Taking that soil protection a step further, cover crops are specific densely planted crops such as grains and grasses that protect the soil from exposure with their foliage. And they bind up those top layers of soil with their roots so erosion doesn't even become a factor. And taking it even further than that, if your climate is right and you start early enough, you can simply plant regular cold season crops and achieve the same things that a cover crop does with the added bonus of some harvest. Crops that encompass all your brassicas, including the kale and collard greens. Not to mention some of your root crops, like beets and carrots. You're growing something and you're protecting your soil over winter. Talk about a double win. Know what else can give you a double win? Checking out the next episode of the Garden Quickie. The Life Cycle of Plants Pick any one of your favorite crops, and I can guarantee you, it's a miracle of nature. From the tiniest of seeds, all the way to the biggest harvests. We grow these things to eat, sure, but I'll be darned if I'm not enthralled, if not amazed, along the way every time. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we also try to enthrall and amaze you. And today's episode is all about plant life cycles. Or more accurately, how we classify the plants we grow based on how long it takes them to reproduce. Time short as always, so let's get into it. No doubt, plants are both classified and categorized in many different ways. One really effective way for us growers to do it though, is by their life cycle. How long it takes that plant to go from seed all the way to flower. Notice how I said flower and not the harvest. Yes, these strawberries here are grown for those luscious berries that come from the flowers, but not all plants are. Some plants are harvested well before the end of their true life cycle. And with that, let's get into those life cycles, of which there are three. First up are the annuals. These are your familiar favorites such as basil, cilantro, corn, potatoes, zucchini, and in colder climates, tomatoes, peppers, and eggplant. These guys sprout, grow, flower, and reproduce all in a single growing season. Hence the name. The second group are known as biennials. As their name suggests, they take two growing seasons to complete their life cycles. Not necessarily two complete calendar years, but two growing seasons. There's a distinction there. These are going to be crops like beets, carrots, chard, onions, garlic, and all your brassicas, like cauliflower and Brussels sprouts. Finally, we have the perennials. And these guys, well, they last at least three growing seasons, usually more. They're going to encompass all your berry plants. Things like blackberries, raspberries, blueberries, and strawberries. But perennials don't stop there. They also include all your fruit trees, like apples and oranges. Not only that, they include the woody herbs, such as rosemary and thyme. Three different life strategies, each one more amazing than the next. Know what else is more amazing than the next? Garden quickies. Hope to see you in the next one.
Fragria and Anasa. Allium sativum. Pisum sativum. Allium sepa. Brassica oleraceae. Also Brassica oleraceae. And Brassica oleraceae. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome back to another episode of the Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we turn confusion into knowledge. And today's episode is all about plant names. Or more specifically, common names versus the scientific ones. What's the difference? Hey, time short as always, let's get into it. Every living thing that's been discovered and classified on the planet has been given a name. Some things, more than one. On the one hand, we have common names, like time. On the other hand, we have the Latin or scientific name, Timus vulgaris. So which one of these is right? Well, they both are. Common names are usually descriptive in nature, which makes them sensible. But, they can also be confusing when more than one common name is attributed to the same organism. It's not unheard of for a plant or animal to have two, three, or even four different common names, adding to the confusion. Think about it. Cilantro or coriander? Zucchini or summer squash? There's tons of examples. With scientific names, however, that confusion doesn't exist. Although they can be sometimes hard to pronounce due to their Latin origins, all plants and animals each only have one scientific name. Split into two, the scientific name consists of the genus first, followed by the species. Officially written in italics with only the genus capitalized, scientific names can also be descriptive, although their main function is to classify and organize. Pretty interesting stuff. Know what else is interesting? These guys keeping my peppers free of aphids and the next episode of the Garden Quickie. Carbon versus nitrogen. Browns versus greens. What sounds like an epic battle in the making is actually the two most important parts of your compost working in perfect unison. Hi. I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome back to another episode of the Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we're always on the same team. And today's episode is all about the carbon to nitrogen ratio of your compost and why it's so important. Hey, time short as always, so let's get into it. The carbon to nitrogen or CN ratio for short is a relative ratio of the two most important categories of ingredients that are in your compost. Carbon, which includes all your brown inputs, and nitrogen, which includes all your green ones. Now, carbon is the energy source, but it's also the base building block of all life and organic matter that's in your compost. It'll be made up of things such as dry leaves, twigs, wood chips, paper, cardboard, hay, and of course straw. Nitrogen, on the other hand, forms the basis of proteins and growth enzymes. Without adequate nitrogen sources in your compost piles, well, microbial activity essentially stops functioning. And these sources are going to be things such as raw kitchen scraps, green grass clippings, spent plants, pulled weeds, manure, and even coffee grounds. And it's the ratio of these two ingredients that's going to have the most effect on how efficient and successful your compost is going to be. As diligent composters, we aim for a ratio of 30 to 1 carbon to nitrogen by weight. It should be noted though, nitrogen sources are usually more dense and thus heavier than the carbon ones. And if you're just eyeballing it, this skews the volume ratio quite a bit. It's going to appear that your compost is much higher in carbon sources 
than it actually is. Really though, we have to try not to stray far from this ratio. Too heavy on the green side, and your compost is going to turn anaerobic, and the nitrogen's going to be released as ammonia gas. Yuck, you don't want that. But, too high on the carbon side, and the compost is going to slow right down. And the breaking down of those raw materials, well, that's going to take forever and a day. You know what doesn't take forever and a day though? Watching the next episode of The Garden Quickie. As one of the four essential ingredients for a healthy, successful compost, moisture is absolutely vital to the whole process. It's the vehicle that hydrates and mobilizes the microbes and bacteria, allowing them to break down our compost raw materials. But it can definitely be a case of too much of a good thing. Especially at certain times of the year. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we're just the right amount of a good thing. And today's episode is all about the moisture in your compost. How much do we need and why is it so important anyways? Hey, time is short as always, so let's dive in. And when you do dive in, you find some interesting things. Compost scientists have long suggested that compost piles should be about 50% water by weight. That's good to know, but pretty much impossible for the backyard grower to accurately measure. And with the fluid ever-changing conditions of our piles, it means it's also a fairly useless goalpost. So what do we do? Well, we can start by being more observant. Too dry, and our compost noticeably slow down and become ineffective. But too wet? and the excess water is gonna fill up the air gaps in the profile, turning the pile anaerobic and smelly. Both scenarios are completely obvious without having to actually measure the moisture content. Okay, so how do we affect and fix a moisture level that's out of whack? Outside of manually watering your compost when it's too dry or covering it up when the weather is too wet, there's a couple other things that you can do to adjust the moisture level of your compost. For compost piles that appear too dry, the best solution is to simply layer in some more wet products, usually in the form of greens or nitrogen sources. The two most effective ones would be your raw kitchen waste and green grass clippings. It's a solution that's much better than wasting water, which may be hard to come by at the time of year when your compost pile would be too dry. Now, if your compost is too wet and you think it may be going anaerobic, you can go the other way and add in some browns. These are going to be things like cardboard, dry leaves, dry sticks, or straw. If the result of too much water in a compost is too little air in the profile, then adding in some highly structured carbon sources will right the balance in no time. There we go. Couple easy fixes to get you back on track. Know what else will get you back on track? Watching the next episode of The Garden Quickie. As a shallow-rooted plant with low requirements, strawberries punch far above their weight when it comes to production. Which is why many of us choose to grow them in containers without missing a beat. The plants don't mind, and the amount of berries that we can get in such a small area is staggering. But like anything else, all good things come to an end. And when winter comes knocking, that freewheeling, easy-to-grow attitude gets put to the test. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we're always freewheeling. And today's episode is all about container strawberries. In winter, I got three things to help your potted strawberries survive the coming cold. Time short as always, so let's dive in. Strawberries are tough, hardy, woodland perennial plants. They can most definitely fend for themselves. In fact, unless you're growing them in extreme climates, they don't need any winter attention at all. In containers though, if you're growing in zone seven or colder, you're gonna have to take winter precautions 
for your potted strawberry plants to survive. And after you've cleaned and mulched, there's three easy ways to do this without having to dig those pots into the ground. The first thing I like to do is to group all my strawberry pots together. This is gonna increase the thermal mass, mimicking a much larger bed. Not only that, it's also gonna reduce the exposure to just the sides of the outside pots. Next, another effective way to limit that exposure is to set up your pots along a fence or other structure. Again, this is gonna protect the sides of those pots from the full exposure, taking a little edge off of winter. Lastly, and this one's a bit tricky, but you can move your potted strawberries indoors to an unheated garage, shed, or even a greenhouse. You have to be really careful though. Strawberry plants are meant to be cold in the winter. They're meant to go dormant. The temperature has to stay low enough to not break that dormancy, but not so low that the plants might as well be outside. Strawberries can take as low as 20 degrees Fahrenheit, no problem. As long as the roots are insulated from extreme exposure, your potted strawberries will return with gusto next spring. And hopefully you'll return with gusto to the next episode of the Garden Quickie. What do you call a perennial plant whose shoots are actually biennial? Raspberries. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of the Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we love to science it up. And today's episode is all about raspberry shoots. These guys actually have three different ones on the same plant. I wanna cover them all, time short as always, so let's dive in. Raspberries are actually members of the rose family, hence the thorns, and they're grown around the world in temperate regions. True winter is needed to grow these guys successfully as it's the driving wedge that creates our first two types of shoots, primacanes, and floricanes. Both types of shoots are vertical upright extensions, known as canes, and both can actually flower and fruit. Although in the case of primacanes, that only occurs in certain varieties. Primacanes are the first shoots to come up in the spring, and like we said, they generally only produce leaves. These shoots grow with gusto all summer long, and then they go dormant when winter comes. Turning in to next year's floricanes. So in fact, primacanes and floricanes are the same shoot, separated only by age. Primacanes are a first year shoot, going dormant in the winter, and then turning into a floricane. It's the vernalization and chilling of that primacane that stimulates it to produce flower buds, turning the once foliage only shoot into a fruit producing powerhouse. Amazing stuff. But what about that third guy? Well. Those shoots, you're gonna find coming out of the base of the plants. And they're what we call basal shoots, commonly known as suckers. Like primacanes, suckers are usually foliage only, except that their main purpose is to spread the plant. And they do it extremely well. Suckers on raspberry plants are totally designed to colonize new ground and extend the patch, much like strawberry runners do. And there you go three shoots for an amazingly productive plant. Very cool. Know what else is very cool? You guys that check out all these garden quickies. Hey, I really appreciate it. It's always been said that good things come in small packages. Flowering bulbs are no exception. Perfect, potent powerhouse potential lying in wait for just the right conditions. There's a million to choose from, but all flowering bulbs fall into two main categories. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of the Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we got you covered from spring to summer. And today's episode is all about flowering bulbs. More specifically, the spring ones versus their summer counterparts. Time short as always, so let's dive in. Flowering bulbs are known as geophytes. Basically, 
a dormant vessel or organ stored underground containing an entirely new flowering plant. Lucky for us, we can harvest this stored potential and plant spectacular pop-up flower gardens virtually anywhere we choose. Of all the varieties of flowering bulbs available to us, there's two main types, spring and summer, each named for the season in which they bloom. Spring bulbs, though, are actually planted in the fall, as they require a chilling period, known as vernalization, to properly set and form the flowers. Examples would be crocuses, daffodils, hyacinths, irises, and of course tulips. Summer bulbs, as the name implies, are expected to be in full bloom mid to late summer, and they're planted in the early spring. Examples of these guys would be begonias, gladiolus, polyanthus, and dahlias. Two different flowering bulb types, both contributing to a potential color spectacle for you to enjoy all season long. Know what else you'll enjoy? Checking out the next episode of the Garden Quickie. Although there's a certain understated beauty to fall and winter, I can see why people find it dreary and grey. One way to fight that dreariness is to dream, plan, and plant for a better colour palette. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome back to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we're anything but dreary. And today's episode is all about spring bulbs. My top five choices to be exact. Time short as it always is, so let's dive in. Spring bulbs are dormant, inexpensive little packages of flower power just waiting for the right time to explode. Planted in the fall, they need a winter chilling period to set them up for flowering success. One of the most popular spring bulbs planted worldwide would be daffodils. And with good reason. These long-lived, usually yellow blooms are hardy and super easy to grow. Plant them six inches deep right before the ground freezes and you're good to go. At number two, we've got crocuses. Now, these guys might be small, but they are mighty. They're likely going to be the first ones to come up in the spring. And not only that, they'll be blooming before most of your other plants even show signs of life. They can take the partial shade, but make sure they have good drainage. Pack them in tight and make sure to plant them about three inches deep. Next up, we've got irises. These guys come in a huge array of colors as well as sizes. This is a big family of plants and not all irises are considered spring bulbs. For those that are, make sure to plant them in the fall in a nice sunny location up to 10 inches deep. At number four, we have hyacinths. These are the easiest of all spring bulbs to grow, with many even growing indoors. Pink, purple, and white are the dominant colors, and hyacinths should be planted in the fall, but well before that first frost. Six inches deep is preferred, and always ensure good drainage. And last but not least, we've got the world's most popular spring bulb, which are the tulips. These iconic spring flowers come in a staggering array of colors as well as combinations. Plant them six to eight inches deep, four inches apart in a sunny location, and prepare to be dazzled next spring. Know what else should be dazzling? Hopefully the next episode of the Garden Quickie. Thanks for watching guys. And hey, if Garden Quickies are your thing, be sure to click on this playlist here as we explore and solve more growing issues in two minutes or less.